What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Game Informer Show, the weekly podcast covering the video game industry. Join us every Thursday for a discussion about the latest gaming news, reviews, and exclusive reveals alongside Game Informer staff and special guests from around the industry. I'm your host this week, Alex Van Aken, and today I'm joined by the news hound himself, Wesley LeBlanc. How you doing, Wes? I am doing great. It's been a minute since I've been here, and I'm excited to be back. Yeah, I guess uh, the holiday lead-up was really busy for all of us, yeah. you included. Yeah. You were on some trips. Um, we'll, we'll talk about one of those trips, I believe, later on in the show. But yeah, it's going to be me and you today. And the big talker is our Dead Island 2 cover story which you and i flew to england for we went to visit dam buster studios in nottingham and uh yeah we we had a really good time playing the game i think that's my consensus at least yeah uh, based on what i've talked to you about um and we interviewed the folks who are making it at dam buster which by the way dam buster worked on once upon a time time splitters and time splitters too so as a fan of those games, I was really excited when I walked in into the studio and realized that because they have, you know, posters and stuff on the wall um, of like their catalog, their discography or catalog, you know, gameography. One of those. Yeah, one of those. So we're going to be talking about Dead Island 2 today. We're going to get into Fire Emblem Engage, uh, which Wesley got a chance to preview for us recently. Uh, and then we might talk about a couple of the games that we we finished over break. I know I... I finished Signalis and have a lot of thoughts about it. And Wes has also been playing things like Norco and Neon White, just kind of the, again, the holiday catch up. Um, and then we'll get into a couple of questions uh, at the end. But it's just going to be me and Wes today uh, rolling through. Let's go ahead and get into all the Dead Island stuff, Wes. So you wrote the cover story. I'll let you kind of kick it off. Uh, what's Dead Island 2? Why did we go there? What did we see? Give me the rundown. Yeah, so I write the cover story. Oh, sorry, my accent. Uh, you know, traveling oh. in England, it just kind of comes in and out. I feel, Sorry, if I it... feel that, man. I really do. Sometimes <laughs> it's tough, isn't it? It's tough. You can't, you can't really help it, can you? <laughs> I it's like just the uh, the gift of the gab, really, in it. I think uh, my first crack at this accent was a little more Australian, but um, yeah, know, well, that's what happens was. when you watch Too Hot to Handle every night. Oh, season two, <laughs> season Are four. Season? Oh, jeez. God, it's my what is time. It's my jam on Netflix. It is just okay. Real quick, have you watched Snack vs. Chef yet? No, I haven't. What is that? So that is a reality show on Netflix, um, wherein chefs from like an actual professional chef. This isn't like the other shows where it's like wanna be chefs. It's like okay, these people like some of them are like executive chefs at a place. Yeah. Some of them are food scientists. Some of them probably lied about their credentials based on their performance <laughs> on the show, but they have to recreate famous snacks. So like Flaming Hot Cheetos, Ooh. Kit Kats, uh, Fruit Gushers. So they have to recreate it within like an hour or sometimes two hours and they don't have a recipe and they're just going off of their knowledge and uh, they're trying to get as close to the real thing. And then there's like a round two where they kind of, take the concepts of that snack and make their own original snack. And, you know, there's a panel of judges and all that. And it's a lot of fun. That sounds amazing. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. I will be checking it out. That sounds right up my alley after the hours of 10 PM. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's get into dead Island too, which, um, you know, has a lot in common with reality TV. I think. Yeah, for it's sure. Very melodramatic, uh, very over the top, very aware of itself. Yeah, yeah, I think so, at least most of the time. But yeah, I'll let you dive into it. Yeah, so we got to play, we both got to play about seven to eight hours of Dead Island 2, and we pretty much, the first half of our session, we took it right from the top, so we got to, like, see them set the scene. And basically what's happening is um, Los Angeles has been attacked by this zombie virus. Um, not quite sure if it's the exact same one from Benoit and Dead Island 1, but it is very similar, it seems. And um, the military has evacuated and been attempting to evacuate most people out of the city. And they have surprisingly done a good job. But some people have opted to stick around. Um, and those are the kind... The people that stick around the narrative lead, um, her name was Khan, told me was the, exactly the kind of person you think would flourish in a game like this. Um, and after playing with two of the survivors, 
yeah, it makes sense that these people decided to um, try to stick it out in L.A. Uh, if I had to describe everything we played, it would be, one, just, like, disgustingly gory. Um, and we'll get into this the system and how they do that. Um, and then very over-the-top, but in a not annoying way. I know over-the-top can sometimes have a negative connotation, but it worked for me. It's like campy B-movie stuff, and that's exactly yeah, what they're absolutely. going for. Yeah, You know, Evil Dead type stuff, I feel exactly. like. Exactly, yeah. But yeah, so you're kind of just... Uh, I mean, very similar to Dead Island 1, you get bit and you do not succumb to the zombie virus. And, oh, why is that? You might have something special with your blood. And so your main goal, at least with what we played, is to get that blood to a doctor who is just talking to you, or a scientist who's talking to you through the radio. Neither of us made it there. I assume that's maybe later in the game. But yeah, you're just kind of making your way through different uh, postcard locations in Los Angeles, um, trying to yeah. save the world. Yeah, And I honestly felt like the game when I first, I don't know when I first saw the LA stuff and the Los Angeles, I kind of rolled my eyes like, okay, like, of course you're going to say LA has all these postcard areas because it does, but it's, you know, overused, I think. But honestly, I think dead Island two has a very strong, sense of place um i was really kind of blown away by the environment design and walking through places like beverly hills and bel air or you know we went to like a hotel and like a santa uh, monica pier Pier. santa monica pier yeah and the zombies and all those locations are all kind of a little different like you know um the the of course the locations themselves are um very distinct all of those you know architectural styles kind of differ between those places and i think dead island 2 does a really good job of capturing that in the game and it it was it was really uh it was a nice surprise i think for me as somebody who's probably a skeptic um i mean i not probably i was a skeptic going into this cover story i think i was expecting to play like an okay game and i came out of it at the very least feeling like what we have played if the rest of the game holds up to that quality i would say is a good game yeah for sure i think surprise is like a good word to describe i mean we obviously talked about our thoughts during the trip but like we were both surprised because you know this game's kind of been in uh it's been through the ringer in development like this is the third studio developing it dead island's not the biggest name out there so you know what what how much money is this game getting and all that kind of stuff uh but yeah i came away feeling like I played seven hours of a game that's done. Like if, if you told yeah. me that was the final release, I would have been, I would have, yeah, that would have made sense. I didn't even really run into anything indicating otherwise. Yeah. I mean, I ran into a couple of things, but like no different than honestly, like 1.0 releases these days. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think we both were like really shocked and we kind of kept pulling each other aside. It felt like after our play session, just cause you, you want to kind of, we kind of tend to keep our, our our first impressions, you know, to ourselves. Yeah. On these kind of trips, um, and yeah, so we were just like, "It's pretty good, huh?" <laughs> right. You know, yeah, like, just this like is fun, right? <laughs> whispering yeah. to each other, you know, um, and yeah, so that that kind of I guess sets the overall. That is like how I feel about Dead Island, like the I guess the summation of my feelings. But yeah, let's get into more of the specifics. I think if you're okay with that, Wes. Yeah, for sure. We talked a little bit about L.A., but, I mean, there's the whole combat system, which is definitely melee focused. There are ranged weapons in the game, but ammo is more hard to come by. And also the ranged weapons themselves are very hard to come by, at least early on. Yeah, for us, they seemed like like moments in the game when you find a weapon. I'm sure that won't be the case later, but uh, early on, it's pretty much all melee. But that makes sense because... The melee, at least for me, is what I preferred. Like, you're right up in the action. You're literally pummeling through faces and gore splattering That's like kind of where the, yeah, that's where the flesh system shines. Yeah. Is when you're up close and personal. Um, and that, that also follows the, the groundwork that, like, the first game, Dead Island 1, was very melee heavy. One thing I, I did like um, about it is there's this new skill deck, which have different sorts of character based because you can play as different characters in the game and some characters have innate abilities that others can unlock later on um but they will start with it so like uh, i'm trying to think like the dodge or the block i think those two are 
when you start the game, one character might have one of those and the other could have, you know, another. Uh, but as you go, you're unlocking different abilities that are all kind of themed in different categories. So there's like a survivor category of cards. There's, I think, Slayer. Uh, I don't remember what the third one was, but... Those are the ones I have written down as well. But yeah, they're they're like tarot cards and they're the, the art's really cool on them and you kind of swap them in and out based on what you want. Yeah. So like, yeah, one survivor card I had was called safety first and when you block and dodge successfully you gain a little bit of health so if you want to you know focus on being a a dodging type player or or blocking then you can kind of build around that um now i I should mention like in talking with the team the the goal with these skill cards is not to like create a build per se this isn't like destiny where you're going to have like a decked out character with a certain build but these skills kind of just add flavor to the combat you're doing but like regardless you're still going to be just bonking zombies on the head absolutely yeah and then they have like the innate skills i wrote down danny's uh hers is thunderstruck which every time she has a heavy attack there's a powerful explosion on impact and then bloodlust she regains health with quick succession of attacks so those kind of point you in the direction of where you're going but like you know the for the most part i get the sense that these characters you kind of just pick the one you want to roll with and then experience the game There'll be different dialogue, and I'm sure they have their own little interstitial stories, but, uh, you know, whatever uh, survivor you go with, I think you're still going to be kind of getting the same experience. Yeah, and there's, um, you know, the upgrade system where you're collecting resources in the environment, bringing them back, and and you can put them towards uh, modifiers that you've, you know, found recipes for. Uh, You can kind of repair your weapons with those same materials, and yeah, you, of course, you can buy things from vendors and all of that. It's a lot of what Dead Island 1 was, but definitely feels um, more expanded upon. And I, I mean, we played with, there, we, we got to play with so many weapons. I mean, we played essentially two, we played uh, probably like one five to six hour chunk and then another like hour long chunk of the game. Um, what, the, the majority of our time was from the start of the game. Um, so it was very early, early days, but we got to go through and really kind of see what it, the, what it's like from the start of the game through to, you know, starting to unlock abilities and having a mo- mostly like a roster of already modified weapons, you know, and then we would, we skip essentially did a time skip. They had another save file that was later on in the game. And that's where we got, you know, a little bit of hands on time with stuff like weapons. There's a, sort of like a fury mode where you can turn into a zombie, right? Of yeah. Some you've kind, been something like that. You've been bit and you survive and we didn't it really, it seems like you, you can kind of activate it. Yeah. I don't really know the story reasons and but... they couldn't really tell us too much about it, but like we did use it and you do become, it's like, you know, the screen goes red and you kind of seems like you turn into a zombie for 30 seconds and you're not yeah, invincible. And there's but... a couple of different abilities that you get in zombie mode. Uh, where and you can customize those. I had one where I like shot venom out from my mouth. Uh, another one, I think you could like slam the ground. Essentially, like, it seems like they didn't. I don't think they confirmed this, but based on my my play, it seemed like as you were killing larger, almost like mid bosses, or you, as you were killing enemies, you were almost like taking part of their power or something. That's just like my speculation they they couldn't confirm any of that yeah but a lot of the powers <laughs> yeah a lot of the powers do seem inspired by some of the ones you see the larger zombies using um for what yeah. it's worth but yeah you definitely uh some of them and beyond the fury stuff like some of the enemies do drop uh skill deck cards and sometimes it's random but other times there was a boss where we fought a uh, so let me set this up. We go to this hotel and um, you kind of get the sense that there was supposed to be a wedding happening at the hotel, but it got overtaken by the military to become yeah. like a headquarters. And was it called the uh, Halperin Hotel? Yeah. Yeah. Halperin Hotel. And you're making your way through the hotel. You, you're going into rooms and you're like, okay, this is clearly where the uh, groomsmen stayed. This is where the bridesmaids stayed. This is like the uh, honeymoon suite and then you finally get to there's, like, there's also lots of like uh, uh environmental storytelling and then in like the traditional sense but also like you can pick up um you know notes and and tapes and that kind of stuff yeah 
Um, and then you eventually make your way to the reception hall and it's time for a boss fight and there's a crusher enemy, which is this giant like hulked out type uh, zombie. But this one's wearing a uh, wedding dress and she's the the literal bridezilla and you have to fight her. And her main <laughs> ability is like kind of like a, I don't want to say keep saying Hulk, but like this character kind of is like a Hulk, like a Hulk smash this into the ground. big ground slam. Yeah. Yeah. And then once you defeat her, you get to uh, add that. A skill card into your deck so now you have access to that ability and i can already see like all the places that's going to go i'm sure every big boss fight you'll get a cool new ability to add to your deck that definitely seems like where they're going there was a lot of fun little environmental puzzles the the physics system is uh fairly robust in this you know more robust than i imagine it'd be for dead Island. yeah yeah <laughs> like uh at one point in time i was uh i had you can have you have like water buckets you can carry around. You also have fuel buckets, and I was uh, carrying around the water bucket, and essentially making a line of water down the street, and then I was connecting it to like a live wire, and then that entire streak of water that I had poured down the street became like this electric pool, and it like destroyed the zombies that were inside of it. Same thing with like fire. You can like put fuel on the ground and light it on fire. And, you know, it does its thing. But there's some some neat puzzle solving things where it's like, oh, well, this this wire in this uh, circuit room is frayed and the two ends are on different parts of the ground and I need to turn on this switch. So, OK, let me put some water on the ground and then the current will uh, connect to the the other side of the wire and complete the connection. And then I can use that piece of equipment. Um, that's like, there's like fun puzzles like that. They seem to be kind of like everywhere too. Um, yeah, there's, there's a yeah. ton of loot in the game. So like getting chests and just reaching areas where loot is at, there's like some kind of puzzles like this. I remember one instance, um, on the way to the Halperin hotel, the street is like caved in, kind of looks like a aftermath of an earthquake. And there's like oh, yeah. 10 zombies in the water and you have to go through it kind of. And I think the, uh, person, well, from the, from Dan Buster helping me kind of realized I was not quite sure what to do because I was about to tackle all 10 head on. And he was like, look around you and see if there's anything, you know, that was might... it like a, a car battery or something. No, it was the, um, the street light above the, uh, Oh, the traffic light. Yeah. Um, he was like, throw something at the traffic light. I threw a wrench at it and it knocked the traffic light piece, like the red, green, uh, yellow piece down into the water and it killed them all pretty much instantly. Oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's yeah. cool. And it seems like there's little things like that everywhere. I mean, you could brute force it, but um, I mean, as someone who loves immersive sims, I think I'm going to be on the lookout for little things like that. Yeah, little ways you can kind of poke and prod to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think like the, the combat in general felt really good. The flesh system has been this marketing piece that, I mean, it's more than a marketing piece. It's like a huge part of their engine, but it's been very prominently mentioned in their marketing thus far. And it was again, one of those things where I like kind of rolled my eyes when I first heard it, but seeing it in action is pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, how detailed these, um, these bodies are that you are s- slicing through. It was to the point, do you remember like an early, early halo days where like, I remember distinctly as a kid killing an alien and then shooting their bodies and like the blue blood coming out. Yeah. Yep. It was it was very a, a moment very reminiscent of that as I like was taking these zombies down I would like it's very gruesome but like it was like a feature that we wanted to explore and check out because it's like a been a big part of the game uh but I was sitting there like hacking corpses apart and literally they have like so many body parts like the it, it was kind of wild like how detailed the insides of the body and like the layers of skin and muscle and how you can like honestly just like peel all that apart and like distort it and tear it and shred it. Um, and it's, it's, it's very gory. Um, yeah. And every weapon if, like reacts differently to a hammer. Yeah. Blunt, blunt. blunt. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it damages their, their body frame differently than a, a knife would. And like, I mean, they've got like, you can see like the small intestine, the large intestine, rib cages and hearts and organs, bone skin. Like, it's like all there. It's like, yeah, the human anatomy represented in zombies. And 
uh, you're going to see a lot of it. And yeah, it was just like, I was kind of blown away with how detailed and there's also different body types and, and all of them are, are all procedural and yeah, it's, it's just kind of wild. Yeah. There's like a, it's not a bloater cause that's, um, what is that left for dead? But like an enemy who's like very large and like spits throw up at you basically. And their stomach is like lined with acid. And so when you cut into their stomach, like the first thing you're going to meet uh, after the muscle and skin is like the acid is going to be pouring out of them. And then if you keep hitting them, you'll hit organs and rib cage and all that kind of stuff. I bet, and I, I would be willing to bet the acid damages you. Oh, for, I, yeah, it has to, I bet it does. It's, um, yeah. it's probably the most impressive, like single aspect of dead Island, especially because yeah, before playing it, I was like, okay, that's marketing for sure. Like, it stands for what fully locationally visceration simulator for humanoids, um, yeah. which is, you know, that's cute and fun. And there's been games where gore is a, a big aspect for sure. But like, yeah, they are procedurally generating like what hundreds or thousands they said of different like reactions the body can have. And yeah, audio and visual, like it's all tied together. This is like the core of the game, the core of their engine and animations and all of that. Yeah. And it's, you can do what we did, which is like kill a, a zombie. And then once you're alone, just beat it and see what happens. But even like when you're not really focusing on it, just like seeing the you way, still notice it. yeah, like you're swinging a, a heavy attack with a giant mallet and then the head just like pops and blood and guts go everywhere. It's very impressive in a disgusting, awesome way. I, I was kind of blown away by how detailed it is. Um, and it kind of got my me thinking, I'm like, oh, you could apply this tech to so many different genres. I think I mentioned to you, I was imagining like an Android or something like a robot that had, that was using the same tech where like you had, you know, the armor plates on the outside, then you have, you know, the microfibers and then you get to the wiring and the circuitry and, you know, the hydraulics and like, there's so many different layers of things that they could simulate with this uh, flesh system that I'd be really interested to see them honestly kind of like sell that or license out that tech to other companies to use because it, it truly feels next gen. Um, yeah. Which I, I use that word very cautiously. Um, but I, I it was like, Oh, I, we have like taken another step forward in like the, yeah, you know, just like animation department, I guess. Cause I mean, it's a lot of it is tied to animation, but it's it's so much more than that too. It's really kind of, it's really impressive. And I, I do hope that, you know, I want to see them kind of use it in other applications, but also I'd love to see that tech licensed out to other companies. Cause I think there's a lot of potential for the flesh system. Yeah. And even if they don't, I'm sure some companies are going to be like, we should develop our own cute little yeah. acronym procedural generator flesh thing. Like I'm imagining this type of technology and, uh, uh, Last of Us Three, if they ever made that, um, like, oh yeah, considering yeah. two was already so gory and graphic, like, yeah, imagine if they're procedurally generating like actual human <laughs> skulls that aren't zombies. I will say, like, if you're a parent, um, this is definitely <laughs> a zombie game that is. I feel like some zombie games are like very cartoonish, yeah, in the in their gore. Um, this is like definitely mature. <laughs> yeah, they will get just as a heads up. Yeah, yeah, it is pretty brutal in some places yeah but i mean that's kind of what is that speaks to the heart of what this game is like the one thing that they reiterated over and over was that they are not backing away from zombies and they want zombies to be at the forefront and they're not calling it a different name like this is schlocky b horror camp zombies turned up to 11 and it's a and like they're owning that which i think is important when you're doing something like that because, you know, it sucks to try to do something serious and then it comes off campy. But if you're aiming for campy and you hit it and it exceeds expectations like it did for us in these opening hours, then, like, I think that's um, really cool. And and one thing they talked a lot about, which um, is not necessarily the case, but, like, a lot of zombie stuff lately has been kind of leaning more into, like, the Last of Us side of things. Yeah. Where it's, like, serious and, and macabre and you know, zombies are kind of in the back burner and humans are the real focus here, but they're, you're not shooting or attacking humans here. You were fighting 
zombies and there's not much more to it than that. Um, so I think if you're a fan of Dead Island and kind of like old school zombies, then I think you're really going to enjoy this. Yeah, I, I really like the color palettes and just the vibrancy of this game as well. I think it's like really nice contrast to the subject matter. And I, I think they kind of nail it in that regard. One, one other thing, the writing is definitely like cheesy in some places. Yeah, for sure. Um, and like not not amazing in certain areas um, and kind of get definitely had me eye rolling a couple times, but there are, there's also like a surprising amount of like, I don't know if heartfelt's the right word, but there's, there was, there were several moments where the writing was working for me. Mm -hmm. um, And I was kind of surprised by that, I think. And uh, also this game is like, I think pretty well written in terms of like comedy. There were several moments like one we were, there was a character named, I think, Amanda Stiles. And she's almost, I think she's just like a side character that you can run into. But you find her on this rooftop of this content house in LA. And inside the content house is like, are like YouTube sets and all sorts of like cliches that, um, that I think, you know, people that weren't dialed into that culture could still do. But then there are like very specific lines that characters deliver that like actually got a laugh out of me uh i think like at one of the end of her diatribes you're kind of like helping this character film a montage a zombie killing montage and uh she's kind of directing you with her little camcorder as you're killing zombies on this roof and um it's like okay whatever but then like there's a couple lines where she's uh at the end she's like and no swearing i'm already on two strikes (laughs) Yeah. Like little, little things like that that are like subtle that like maybe somebody who wasn't familiar with like YouTube lingo wouldn't know. But as somebody who manages a YouTube channel and has to worry about copyright strikes, I thought it was stuff like that was like really well done, I think. Yeah. And, and you mentioning that made me think of something interesting about this game, which is I mean, it's called Dead Island. This is Los Angeles, which is not an island, but you can't because of the military evacuation, you can't leave and you can't come in. So it's symbolically an island is kind of what they're going for. But what's cool about that is like this character you mentioned, she is uploading a YouTube video and you'd probably like, in what world are people watching YouTube videos in a zombie apocalypse? But this isn't like a worldwide zombie apocalypse. It seems, I don't have confirmation of that, but like, I think people, I don't know, in Florida or Minnesota are, are, doing fine. I mean, there's a zombie apocalypse in Los Angeles, but like the idea is that it's contained in this giant city in California. Um, and so it's cool to see little things like that, that kind of speak to what's going on outside the world, which is if she still cares about uploading YouTube videos, then clearly there's places in the world where you can still watch YouTube videos. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot of fun stuff going on in Dead Island too. I, I think is it is it uh you know one of my most anticipated games of the year? No, it doesn't have to be. I think that's unfair to put on any game, but like I am I was really surprised, like I said at the at the top with how enjoy how much enjoyment I got from those roughly 8 hours of play. And then it's 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 funny in places. It's also like pretty creepy in other areas even though it is like they're really trying to sell the fun aspect of zombies there are definitely places um like at the carnival for instance which is like the second section um of dead island 2 that we played and i think you pointed out in your cover story kind of was reminiscent of zombie land a little bit yeah at least some of the characters and stuff but uh also like that setting in particular reminded me of it but uh that part was actually like pretty creepy like there's several moments where you you are in these very dimly lit areas and you're kind of being stalked by this clown But yeah, it's kind of got a wide array of themes and tones. It's kind of weaving in and out of. Yeah. And I mean, it is like still a horror game, um, which is something that they drove home a lot. But it's more of like a action horror comedy romp. Like there, a lot of it is you feel confident and you feel really good surviving in this world because that's what these characters are. They are not necessarily scared of the zombie apocalypse happening around them they're kind of 
enjoying it. But there are moments, like you mentioned, where you're at the Santa Monica Pier and you're there's like a clown that you eventually fight as a boss who crawls and jumps around like a spider. His arms have been shaved down to where his bones are basically like stabbing pincer sword things. And it's terrifying. Like that at that moment I was not feeling confident and laughing. It was just like this is terrifying. I don't like this clown spider thing. And I think at least in what we've played so far, they're doing a really good job balancing that, uh, which is super important because you know it is zombies. It still needs to have an element of horror. Yeah, and a lot of those behaviors are different too between the zombies. I think like the the clown guy, was it Butch Butcho? Butcho the Butcher, yeah. Yeah, Butcho the Butcher. He he walks on all fours and his front two are those swords, those knives that are his bones. And like his gimmick is like if you damage him, he's gonna try to run away and feast on on other corpses to regenerate. Um and also I believe that zombie can also deflect bullets, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, at certain bones. moments. Yeah, like yeah. put him up as a guard. Yeah, so it's a lot more than just oh that zombie uh, spits acid that zombies big and hits hard there, there's some good variation i think going into it yeah i think like my biggest takeaway from this cover story and this trip is i don't know i i, I think it's fair to admit anybody who has been paying attention to this game has probably not been expecting too much because it's been god i don't even know like a decade since the last one and this is the third development studio and i don't know you you wouldn't be able to tell that it's had a, a troubled history of development. Um, I should they note. They did get to start from scratch. Yeah, I was about to note that. They did. Dan Buster did start from scratch. They said, so like, this is their product. But yeah, it just, I don't know. Anytime a game gets announced and then you don't see it for like a decade, you're probably like, hmm, I don't know about this. But if what we've played so far or any indication, I think that this one's going to be like a, a pretty great time. Are you cool with getting into some listener questions here, Wes? I am. We've got some specifically about Dead Island uh, 2. Let's see. Uh, Troidal Power in Discord asks, what was the single most satisfying weapon you got to try out Uh, in in Dead Island 2? Not just like in general, unless that opens up some weird weird story opportunity. In Dead Island 2, I think the most satisfying weapon for me, I think there was like a stave of some sort, if I recall. That was really fun, uh, but I ha- I found like Wolverine claws. I don't know. Did you find those? Wes? No, I didn't. I remember looking over and seeing that you had them, and uh, they said I already missed them, so I was pretty bummed. But they looked sick. Yeah, those were a lot of fun. Uh, but how about you? My favorite. So I actually wrote down a few of my favorites, and I'll just mention them because the names are great. The uh, enhanced electrocutor machete, which is a machete that has electricity running through it. The slaughtering cremator cleaver, which was my favorite. Um, it's like a cleaver and it has flames. Well, not flames. It like burns on the edges. Um, and it kind of, you can see that effect because of the flesh system, which is really cool. So you'd kill somebody and then kind of see some cauterization happen. It lights them on fire and it swings fast. It was a good time. And then my other favorite was the enhanced impactor improvised hammer, which is like, it's kind of like a giant mallet hammer, but it seemed it, it plays like it has a jet engine attached to the back of it when you swing. So it just like, blows through zombies like cuts them right in half with blunt force which is awesome to watch happen on screen biscuits with davy asks what was the most memorable landmark in your playthrough i think bel air yeah was pretty memorable cool place. i think for me it would be well, actually hold on bel air is like the mansions and stuff right yeah 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 that was cool there's some really cool um side characters there too there's a guy who can't find his pants which is funny <laughs> The my favorite was probably the one we talked about the Halperin Hotel. Um, not necessarily because like the location was cool looking. It was kind of like a pink hotel, which there is a hotel in that area in real LA that is pink and looks like that. But just like the boss fight, the wedding or the uh, bridezilla boss fight was really cool. And that the way that level pieces together, its storytelling is is really awesome. Logan asks, Dead Island Two has nearly a decade of hype. Highs, lows, and disappointing delays. How are you guys feeling about it? Feels like they are not only fighting to make space for themselves in the zombie action slash adventure realm, but against the title itself. Yeah, again, I think like a fair bit of, I think skepticism is fair 
uh, going into this game. Um, and I, I still share that to a degree, but I'm definitely a lot more uh, optimistic about where this project's headed after our, our cover story. Yeah, like we've kind of said it a few times now, but obviously we don't know what the final product is. We don't know how long the game is, but the um, like seven hours we played, if that's an indication of what's in store, then this I think is going to be Dead Island fans are going to love this. Zachary Pluggy asks, who on the GI staff would be able to survive the longest if they're put into Dead Island 2? And how long do you think you'd be able to last yourself? So real quick, I think we should do who would survive the longest and who would die the quickest. And I have the answer to the latter. I think Matt Miller would die the quickest. You think because so? Because <laughs> he's too nice. Yeah. He is and he nice. would he would <laughs> open his doors, his metaphorical or physical door to help others in need because that's the kind of guy he is. And now it end up getting him killed. That's actually a really good answer. I was going to say myself because I just have no survival instinct like that, but that is true. Matt is Matt would let a zombie in if the zombie asked for help. Yeah. <laughs> and who would survive the longest? Gosh. He's not on staff anymore, but I feel like if we can count Dan Tack. Oh. Dan Dan would 100 He'd be running the the like people's militia. Yeah. Uh, he would the, he'd the, be the guy that would be walk- over. And he would He'd be, be like booby trapping like the mansion and yeah, but but current. Let's keep it to current staff, I guess. Hmm. I think I think I'm gonna go with Brian Shea because I know I think he works out or at least he's mentioned yeah. it before, and I feel like that's a big aspect of surviving the zombie apocalypse. Like I could maybe sprint for. I don't even know. 20, 30 seconds, my asthma kicks in, I'm out. I'm done. Like, that's the end of me. Okay, but you don't have to sprint if you're quiet. I'm also not quiet. <laughs> I'm uh, not a quiet person either. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I feel like there's got to be, I don't know what the definitive answer would be. I think Brian's a good candidate. I think I would last a good amount of time. I don't know if I'd last the longest. I did go to survival camp as a kid, Wes. Oh, shoot. Um, oh, and they taught whoa. you how to walk quietly, even on leaves. Whoa. And how to start a fire. Do you know how to slow your heart rate down? No, I don't. I never oh. learned that. Dang. Yeah, I have anxiety, so it probably would be really hard for me to slow my <laughs> heart rate down. I feel that. I think, But uh, I can start a fire. I can cook. Ooh, that's important. You're going to be cooking some probably not tasty stuff, given the ingredients around you in a zombie yeah. apocalypse. I, I think I could, I think I have the people skills to like make trusted allies. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big one. Okay. That was a fun question. Thank you, Zachary. We do have a couple from Twitter because I posted a call out from our Twitter account. Hush asks, will there be any references or characters from the previous games? Uh, definitely. Sam B uh, is returning in Dead Island 2. And he is a, like, main character, it seems like. Yeah, you meet him early on. I think he's the only returning character that I know of. That was the only one I recognized? Yeah. But we only met a few characters, and all of them seem new except him. Uh, Lucas asks, is the gore on The Last of Us 2 level or even better? I think we'd both probably say better. Yeah, I think so. I mean... I think, I think Last of Us is like visuals are overall better, but that's kind of to be expected. That's one of Naughty Dog's like big things is visuals, but like the actual gore and the extent to which it goes and the animations attached to it, I think Dead Island might take the cake. Uh, and last question uh, comes from Joe Blazer, who asks, biggest influence for art design? I don't remember all of the specifics, but I know several I've interviewed the team a couple times now and something they reiterated on our cover story trip is that eighties action movies are a big influence on the art direction. They mentioned um, the art director or maybe it was just one of the art leads uh, specifically mentioned RoboCop too. quite a few Okay. Times. You're right. I thought so. So yeah, I think that the entire, the, we should have mentioned this maybe at the top, but their version of LA um, according to Dan Buster is like through the Hollywood lens. 
Um, it's yeah. not like a hyper realistic. Yeah, pulp. It's not a hyper realistic L.A. It's kind of the L.A. you saw and you see in movies today, and you probably saw in the seventies and eighties, and you know this romanticized version. Exactly. Yeah. Pulp, action, lots of color, and lots of lots of blood. So but I think blood. that'll do it for our our Dead Island two cover story talk Wes um you've been playing another game that you can talk about finally yeah uh, fire emblem engage yeah you previewed it did you fly somewhere to preview this no no uh uh-uh. just um playing it on on my own switch but uh yeah it's um I can only talk about a certain amount of it um I've put about 11 hours into the game right now and uh it is more fire emblem and I say that in the best way because I'm having a really, really, really good time with it. Oh, good. It seems to be more traditional Fire Emblem versus Three Houses, which seem to kind of be a little more different for the series, especially with the school mechanic. Like, none of that is here. This is a classic story or classic fantasy story so far. And you are the main hero and you're kind of just trying to save the world. Uh, the combat is is very similar to previous Fire Emblem games, as you expect. But the main um, new thing here is the engage mechanic. So certain characters, um, such as the Divine Dragon, which is the protagonist who you play as, have emblem rings that they wear. And inside these emblem rings, or I don't know if it's inside, I don't actually know how it works yet story-wise, but because I'm wearing the emblem ring, I can engage with it and basically summon Marth, which uh, is a previous Fire Emblem character. Uh, or Super Smash Bros. character, if you're like me. And you kind of get to tap into his like battle power and potential and strength. Your, your moves are stronger. You get access to a special move you can use when engaged with Marth. You can move farther on the map, and your character basically rarely takes damage or dodges like every attack when they're um, engaged to a spirit or fire emblem, soul, whatever. Um, again, I'm not sure how that's working. I just know that when I hit the engage button... Marth comes out and we talk and we have a little relationship and we kill people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's yeah. a good summation. <laughs> but there's like various rings and different characters have them. And it's, and you can read my preview thoughts um, now on gameinformer.com, but I kind of talk about how I'm a little worried that the difficulty is not quite up to par because of this engage mechanic. Um, for example, I'm rolling like four characters right now with engage or emblem rings on, on top of my like 10 person team. And when I have four characters out using the engage mechanic, they're basically unstoppable tanks and I'm kind of just steamrolling enemies. And I'm hoping that there's more difficulty Mm -hmm. further in the story based on where I think the story is going. I imagine there will be some difficulty coming up, but yeah, these first 10 hours have been very, um, more on the easy side. Is there a permadeath option? There is, yeah. There's the uh, return of classic is what they call the permadeath one in casual, um, which is where if your allies die in combat, then they basically come back to life afterwards. So they kind of just faint. They don't die. I'm playing on casual um, because there are a lot of cool characters. And to be honest, I want to like talk to them and have support conversations and bonds with them because that's a big part of Fire Emblem. And I Yeah, but what if they could die, Wes? Oh, I mean, I have, you can change the difficulty. I I think you can't go back and forth over and over. I think once you switch to classic, you can't go back to casual. But um, yeah, what I mean, they could die. I haven't is the thing. I haven't lost a teammate yet. So like I'm 10 hours in and no one's died yet. I, I either I'm really good, which I don't think is the case because this is like my second or third Fire Emblem game ever. Uh, or it's very easy in the opening hours, which is fine because I'm still loving every moment I play this game. The combat is still so much fun, even though I'm kind of steamrolling often. It's wild how 10 hours in is still opening hours. Yeah. Well, I don't know if, it, I mean, I don't know where the end is, but it definitely You're feels opening hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it's, if this ended up being 40, 50 hours, I wouldn't be surprised. Are you still getting tutorials 10 hours in? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That says everything. I still have like locked. So there's the main hub. It's called Somniel. It's like a castle where you can go and visit. There's still places that are like locked off for me there. So I know that more tutorials are coming. But yeah, so it, I'm having a really good time. If you like Fire Emblem, I think you're going to like this game. Simple as that. I still think Three Houses is the better onboard. If you've never played Fire Emblem and you want to check out what it's about, 
where I'm at so far in Engage, which is 10 hours, I think three houses first 10 hours do a better job like enrapturing you in this world, in their world. What's the pacing like since you don't have the school mechanic to deal with now? It's surprisingly similar. I think, I don't know how everyone's played three houses, obviously, but for me, it was like, go do some battles, check back in at school, and then run your routines. So I would go check in with these people, give them gifts, go have a few meals with people. And I kind of had a routine checklist, but I wanted that checklist. I liked that checklist. And I've kind of done the same thing with Engage, which is I'll go and do some story fights and then some optional skirmishes. And then I'll go to Somniel, which is like the main castle hub, and I'll check in with people there, have some meals. I'll go look at the dogs and cats and birds and sheep I've adopted out on my pasture. And um, I kind of run through a checklist there. And I don't say checklist yeah. in a like demeaning way. I enjoy turning this game into that. It's like I'm, you know, I'm kind of like the the ruler of this team, the the leader of this team, and I'm checking in with everybody and making sure we're all set to go before the next fight. Sick. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about with Fire Emblem before we take a break? If you want to see gameplay of it, you can go to the Game Informer YouTube channel to watch a new gameplay today featuring me and Brian. And if you want even more expanded thoughts on Fire Emblem Engage, you can read my preview, which is up on GameInformer.com. Awesome. Let's uh, get into housekeeping real quick before we uh, wrap up the show with the second half of the playlist. Of course, we always start housekeeping off with a new podcast review. Uh, this week, we actually, I want to say thanks. Over the holidays, we got a lot of new reviews, so uh, we'll get through those one at a time. Thank you, everybody, for sending those in. This week's podcast review is a five-star review from Santa's Pants. Uh, the headline of the review says the best in the review says the time these legends put into this show is amazing. It always makes me happy. They are so funny and great. Did my mom write this? <laughs> I will continue to listen to this amazing show. Thank you so much. Santa's pants. I appreciate that. Thank it's you. Very, Santa's pants. very nice. Very um, true. Very true. Very encouraging. I honestly thought you could be my mom. Like, you know, it's very nice of you. Um, so thank you so much for, for leaving that review. Uh, if you want to go and leave us a review and be read off on the show, uh, because we definitely want to say thank you. If you take the time to do that, uh, you can have it or head over to Apple podcasts and leave us a review over there. We love five star reviews, but you know, we also want honest reviews. So if you have a piece of uh, feedback for us, be sure to leave it there. And you can also rate us on Spotify. If you don't have a Apple ID, uh, that's going to be the review for this week. There's a lot of great stuff over on the website. Coming back from break, we uh, we did have stuff go up on the break. Um, so if you you know didn't read GameInformer.com over the break, there's some cool stuff waiting for you. And uh, we've got a lot of stuff rolling out in the next few weeks. I've got another documentary coming uh, in like the next three weeks that I worked on with Blake. Uh, we've got a magazine coming out at the end of the month. We've got a lot of stuff, a lot of also, I'm really excited for like the games that are coming out this month too. Well, we got one piece coming out. Uh, I'm really looking forward to season Wes. Ooh, yeah. Um, Forsaken. This, oh, dude, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's an exciting time in January. It'll kind of be a slow start, but um, we are definitely ramping up and it's going to be a great year at game informer. If you want to support the show, uh, you can go and get a magazine subscription. That's the best way to support us because we are all an extension of Game Informer magazine. Uh, that is kind of our lifeblood, as it is, as it were. And uh, yeah, you can go and get one of those subscriptions. You can get a digital subscription for fourteen ninety nine. That'll get you an annual subscription, uh, ten issues a year, and uh, that's yeah, fifteen bucks a year. Uh, you can get it digital. You can get it. I think print is like five more bucks. Um, you can get that through GameStop. I think you can also get that through the app store. So yeah, go, uh, go get a magazine subscription. It really does help us out. And, uh, we have a lot of awesome P I mean, I feel like the magazine leveled up this last year, honestly. Like I agree. I look at what we have in that thing and I'm like extremely proud of it. Um, like I, I yeah, I think it's absolutely sick. What, what the mag team. And I mean, I mean, 
Game Informer as a whole, um, I think we've really just leveled up our coverage and the types of things that we do. We have freelancers now, and they're helping yeah. bring a totally new voices to like the magazine, which I think is really cool to see new names. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also means like, you know, they are also doing the function of filling pages. And so that also means that like staff writers, when they're going to put something in the magazine, it's going to, you know, it's really going to be high quality because they've had even more time to hone it because, you know, our, our freelancers are, are also helping to fill pages with like really interesting stuff. So I think all in all, like it's a really cool time for Game Informer and yeah, we would love you. Uh, if you went and supported us on the magazine side of things, but um, yeah, that's going to do it for housekeeping. Be sure to follow Wes on social media uh, at LeBlanc Wes L E B L A N C W E S. Uh, and you can follow me, Alex Van Aken at it's Van Aken. Of course, go and listen to our other gaming podcast, all things Nintendo hosted by Brian Shea. It's a weekly Nintendo podcast that releases every Friday. Uh, and lastly, shout out to Matt Storm, our podcast editor. Go and listen to their podcasts, uh, Fun and Games, and Reignite, which is uh, their Bioware podcast. So go show them some support, and um, we'd really appreciate it. So, Wes, let's wrap up the show with the uh, last couple games we've been playing over the break. I've been playing a lot of... I beat Signalis, actually, like the last the last day of break, I think. What... I, I really like that game a lot. I, I, I loved it. Um, I think the first half, the first act of that game is like intentionally really confusing, but I don't know if I just like got lucky and found things that other people didn't or if I just, if things just clicked for me in a different way. But I felt like act two of Signalis really ties things together in a really interesting way and gives you a, it's all a little obfuscated, but I felt like I had a really clear picture of this really interesting narrative and like, it really struck me kind of emotionally, like some of the characters and their, what they go through and and their relationships with each other and kind of their pursuits and everybody's kind of shared goal of survival and just the, the madness and the hell that all of those characters go through. It's, it's a tragedy really, or like really kind of heartbreaking in a lot of ways. And, and, also, just like a damn good survival horror game. Yeah, I was going to say, I admittedly had to, I watched a video afterwards about the game's story, just kind of, I had a good idea of what it was, but um, I am I did miss a lot because I watched these videos breaking it down, and I was like, oh yeah, that's even more awesome than I thought. But like, if you completely miss the story, you're still getting like a really fantastic Silent Hill-esque um, horror game that also is sci-fi. Like, playing Signalis is very fun and very different for the horror genre only be- not because you know we don't have games like this but they just don't get made as often anymore you know horror yeah. has moved into like the 3d space like most games and it's cool to play something something that is still so scary but using this style i think was really awesome for me yeah i uh it's like this dirty ps1 2.5d aesthetic Uh, the camera rendering settings are like very pixelated despite like these objects being 3d. So it all, this is really unique style and yeah, the audio design also puts in a lot of work um, for like selling the horror, like the screams that the, the replicas make um, are just terrifying. Um, But yeah, I really, really enjoyed the game. Um, I think like, even the puzzles for me, a lot of the puzzles I really enjoyed. There might've been like one or two I didn't love, but I felt like every puzzle was something different. Even though you're backtracking physically in the game, the puzzles themselves, each one felt uh, different. Some of them are more obvious than others, but yeah, I, I don't, I think I used, I peeked at a guide for the very last puzzle of the game. Uh, and that was just cause I was overthinking things. And mm. uh, which and one was it? it was, I, I used a guide for the butterfly thing which was like so obvious once i looked up what it was oh no uh it was uh the dials uh yeah that one was pretty tough too yeah i was i was looking at the wrong part of the solution um i was over it it was much simpler than i thought it was but for the most part like that game i went in completely ignorant to 
and just figured out the puzzles on my own. And it was a really rewarding experience. And I think it shot up to my top three of 2022 Ooh, games. Nice. Yeah, I, I really like that game. Recency bias probably playing some sort of factor in that, but whatever. It's it's a really sick game. Um, and I think it's on Game Pass, isn't it? Yep, that's where I played it. And if you don't want to play it on Game Pass, it's, it's fairly cheap, I think. I think it's less than $20. Um, and it's really rad. So I played it on Steam Deck. I was just about to say, it seems like a good Steam Deck game. Yeah, that's where I played... 90 percent of it um i really like that game really cool uh sci-fi story and i like uh how it approaches like the i the concept of like i don't even want to give it away i'm not even gonna say that just go play signalis if you have any interest in survival horror it's not it is tense i wouldn't say it's like uh like i'm 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 a pretty big wimp and i was able to get through it um i don't there's not really jump scares or anything like that it's just like this foreboding atmosphere yeah the scares come from like for me at least i knew i had to go through this hallway i have no ammo and there's like six enemies in there and i'm like adrenaline's pumping and i'm like crap how am i gonna do this but yeah there's no like jump scare this isn't like re2 level of scary you're not gonna be like shouting and screaming (laughs) yeah but uh really solid game um wes what games did you play over break so I did beat Signalis, which um, I had forgotten about before when we were talking before the show. But um, I also beat Norco and Neon White. Um, I'll dive Ooh, into nice. Neon White first because uh, I'm sure that has been talked about a bunch. I know it's on a lot of people's top 10 lists here. And I, I know especially Blake has um, been singing the praise of that game since he reviewed it, like, what, March last year or something? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just like speed running first person speed running turned into a game. But I think what's most fascinating for it for me is like, if you told me that I would be turned off immediately to that game, I don't, I'm not really much into speed running. It's not, I'm not about chasing medals or high scores or anything like that. And yet I hundred percent of this game got the top medal you could get for each of the level. Well, not the top, but the, the ACE medal for every level, every gift you can find in the, you know, secret parts of the level. I did all of that because I was just hooked. Um, And I think that's what's so brilliant about Neon White is that it turns you into like a speedrunner without you realizing it. Yeah. It's great music, great visuals. Story um, is not the wildest thing ever, but it's serviceable enough. I ended up liking it in the end. Um, I I didn't really like the delivery. It's kind of like visual novel-esque. Well, no, it is a visual novel. Um, And at, at the beginning, especially in the beginning, so if you're starting this game... Listen up, it is. it can be very cringe, but it comes around and you get to know these characters more and it turns out to be great. But yeah, in the beginning, it's very like tropey and uh, at least for me, cringe. And I was kind of just skipping through the dialogue. And then about halfway through, I hit a point where I was actually paying attention to all of the dialogue. That might just be a me thing, but... Um... No, it's definitely cringe. Okay, cool. And I, think, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it knows it's cringe too. Yeah. It's... Vi- very like online aware kind of definitely um, but yeah it's even if like the story never clicks with you the gameplay is so so worth getting through the story it's fantastic gameplay yeah and then what was your last one norco norco yeah this is a um point and click adventure game that takes place in norco louisiana uh i don't know why i took this long to play this game i should have played it shortly after release uh half of my family's from louisiana and um Louisiana like I've been there countless times I'm very familiar with the culture and the food and you know it runs in my family and this game felt like a weird depressing strange version of home um there are parts of Louisiana that are you know very impoverished because of hurricanes and stuff like that and Norco kind of takes place in those areas and it's really shining a light on the the game is basically about the ways that religion and corporations have deteriorated parts of the south the south yeah um dang i gotta play this then no it's i'm it's, I'm from the south myself oh yeah it's it's fantastic like especially with the way religion has like it has a lot to say about religion and what religion does to people when it becomes an obsessive cult-like thing you know it's not a complete indictment of religion or christianity or really anything like that but it is talking about what happens when 
stuff like that becomes more cult-like than anything else and how that affects people. And on the same note, it's about capitalism and how corporations can just move into a place, take it over, and not care at all about the people that call it home, um, which hit home for me because, um, you know, I have a lot of family and, and love in Louisiana. Uh, and they also nailed Louisiana. Like, I can confirm they did the research. They got the, the words right, the food right, the names right. Like, it's all, this is authentic Louisiana. And then That's really neat. it's a great point and click, too. Like, it's a fun time. It's not, it's not too hard. It's not like a 90s point and click or early 2000s where you're, you just have no idea why the clicking the light bulb three times opens the doorknob. Um, it's very yeah. simple. They're not trying to obfuscate too much. Like they want to tell you a story and you're doing it through point and click. I would recommend it to like basically anybody short game too, like maybe six or seven hours. Dang. Okay. That might be another steam deck game for me then. I played it um, on steam deck. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I've, I've got a very long flight this weekend and it might be time to do Norco. Cause I mean, a lot of those themes you're, you're talking about uh, really hit home for me in a lot of ways. Uh, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by that. I I think I knew it was about the South. I didn't know the specifics of what it was trying to tackle. Yeah. The American South. It goes places so. too. It's, I could spoil the game for you and you still would be like, what? <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, I think that's going to do it for the show this week, Wes. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I hope you listeners enjoyed this little cozy two person episode. We don't do many of those these days. I had a great time. So did I. Just a heads up. I will not be hosting next week. I think one Kyle Hilliard, our magazine content director, will be guest hosting the show. I will be en route once again to Japan. Um, So I'm just going to delegate and not even have to worry about getting an episode up. But uh, Kyle and company will be keeping you company uh, next Thursday. Yeah. All right, y'all. Have a good day. Thanks for listening. Be sure to share the show with a friend and leave us a review. We will see you next time. Goodbye. Bye.